I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I first started talking to Thomas and to Hannah Munch about uh, thinking about new paradigms uh, at least two and a half years ago, possibly a little bit more. Found that uh, I and my colleague Laurie Lamborn Langton uh, and Thomas and Hannah uh, um, were thinking on very similar lines, and we've been working quite closely together over the last. Uh, over this period. We've set up in the UK an organization which Thomas mentioned called the Economic Change Unit, um, uh, which is trying to do something not exactly the same because the circumstances in the UK are different, uh, but similar, with cer certainly with similar goals, and uh, we're very proud to be partners uh, of Forum for a New Economy. I'm going to talk about um, paradigm change. Um, I, uh, this is work that I've done with Laurie and built on work that we did with Alfie Sterling. Um, uh, on the idea of paradigm change and the way in which paradigms change in economic and social policy. Um, I have quite a lot of slides. This is, was originally a longer presentation. I had two options. I was told I had 15 minutes. Uh, so I had two options, which was to cut down the number of slides or to speak more quickly. Um, and I've gone for the latter strategy. So you're going to have to uh, focus quite hard yourselves. So um, paradigm uh, shifts in economic theory and policy. The core argument here is that eras of uh, political economy can be roughly split um, uh, uh, and can be roughly divided into those when particular sets of ideas dominate economic uh, thought uh, and uh, policy making. And these can be called political economic paradigms. It's important that, that we don't just call them economic paradigms. One of the uh, risks of going down this kind of an analytical route is that you focus entirely on economic theory. And as I shall argue in this, this is not uh, uh, simply about economic theory at all. And paradigms shift or change um, at certain moments, usually, uh, or, or uh, in, in the analysis we've done, after a crisis and policy failure when an old paradigm is replaced by a new one. Um, this, is, uh, this kind of analysis is drawn from the analysis of paradigms in the natural sciences, Thomas Kuhn, Imre Lakatos, and others. Um, but obviously, social sciences, the uh, world of politics and policymaking is different, uh, and therefore this is a very particular uh, kind of analysis. When I presented this in academic fora, um, you immediately get all kinds of criticisms, objections, um, uh, and other kinds of uh, qualifications of the theory, um, many of which are valid. The world is not as simple as I'm going to present it today. But the advantage of having a kind of meta-theory of the ways in which politics and uh, uh, economic policy and economic theory change is that it can give us a big picture and not simply get us bogged down in the minutiae of the things that are happening um, minute by minute in these, or week by week, or even year by year in these worlds. So I hope that although there is some violence being done to the complexity of the way in which change occurs, nevertheless, this big story does give us a handle on, uh, uh, on change. So what is a paradigm? A paradigm, in our view, has four components. It's a set of primary economic goals which dominate thinking about the economy and policy making, which are regarded as the most important goals to be de dealt with. Secondly, it's a general analytical framework for thinking about how to uh, achieve those goals and ways in which economies work. It's a public narrative and discourse, a language, um, to use to talk about those things, which justifies the goals and the analytical framework. And then it's a set of principal economic and social policies which will achieve the goals. So a paradigm has all four of those elements, and it isn't just one. And that's quite important because often the criticism is that we're talking about only one of those things. Um, uh, this theory, as I say, is based on work that has been done in the social, in the, originally in the natural sciences and, and then in the social sciences. I'm not going to go through that. If you look at the way paradigms have shifted over the last 100 years, and I will uh, uh, explain the major two, there have been a common, broad process. There is a prevailing orthodoxy, an originating paradigm. Then some economic shock or crisis occurs. The policy prescriptions of the old paradigm, the prevailing one, fail. They can no longer cope with the new conditions of shock or crisis. People increasingly question whether that uh, framework of thinking, whether that paradigm is any more any use to us in the conditions of shock and crisis. 
In the meantime, an alternative paradigm has been developed outside the mainstream. As the breakdown occurs, this becomes increasingly the orthodoxy. And then, at some critical point, a new government is elected, which has the alternative paradigm as its basis for working, and new kinds of economic policies are pursued. In that process of change, we can identify three different levels uh, of where change occurs. The weakest of these is the one on which economists and people who think about this in an academic terms tend to focus, which is the analytical basis uh, in the paradigm. So there is always in this process a shift in the analytical frameworks that are used to understand the economy. But these are never hegemonic. If you look at academic life and university life, there is never a single theory, a single academic framework which everybody believes in. And so this is, in that sense, the weakest form of the change. There is a change which occurs, but it is never universal. The public debates and narratives is a much stronger form of change. You can really see the way in which debate changes from one kind of uh, mode of operation to another. But the most decisive level is at the political level. It is the election of governments who introduce new policies based around a new paradigm who really mark the shifts in, uh, in this process. And it is broadly true to say that if there weren't decisive political moments, elections of new governments, then the intellectual frameworks that are changing would be merely footnotes in intellectual history. And therefore, we can't deny that the real moments of paradigm shift coincide with, the ch with changes of governments. The argument here, in fact, I'm going to go, uh, let me just, um, rests on two big historical moments in the last 100 years when paradigms have shifted. One was um, the core date, the core election date in the US and the UK, and then subsequently in other European countries was 1945. The Wall Street crash of 1929, which led to the Great Depression, um, exposed the limitations and failures of the laissez-faire paradigm, which, had, which was dominant in the, in the period after the turn of the, 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 uh, the 20th century and right the way through uh, the, uh, up to the late 20, uh, 1920s. That laissez-faire paradigm did not predict, could not cope with, and had no solutions to the Great Depression, which followed the Wall Street crash. The argument of the laissez-faire economists was that labor, should, we should force wages down in order to price unemployed workers back into the labor market, something, of course, which Keynes immediately saw would merely take demand out of the economy and would be counterproductive. Keynes in economics was the body of theory that was waiting, in a sense, for that moment. Keynes had started work on his theory um, uh, after the First World War. And, it, and during the 1940s, that became uh, the orthodoxy. Um, and uh, after 1945, new governments were elected that pursued effectively Keynesian uh, policies. Um, and for about 30 years, the Keynesian consensus, the post-war consensus, full employment, the welfare state, um, was the dominant paradigm. But this broke down in the 1970s, when a combination of shock factors, the breakdown of Bretton Woods, the oil shock, and so on, led to the phenomenon of stagflation, as it's sometimes called, simultaneous recession inflation, which seemed to contradict a core tenet of Keynesian economics, the Phillips curve. And Keynesian policies no longer seemed to be able to cope. Waiting in the wings was the body of free market theory, which had been developed by Friedrich uh, Hayek and Milton Friedman and others from the late 1940s onwards. And that was then picked up by governments led by Margaret Thatcher in the UK, Ronald Reagan um, in the US, and then a succession of European uh, uh, pr prime ministers and presidents elected in the early 1980s. Um, and the free market, sometimes called the neoliberal paradigm or the Washington consensus, then became dominant. So these are the historical changes that inform the theory. Um, the free market or neoliberal paradigm can be analyzed in terms of the four components uh, of paradigms in general. They're marked on the left. So what, what were the core uh, components of that? Well, the first thing was a shift in the goals, the primary goals of economic policy. The primary goal of economic policy in the Keynesian era was full employment and the maintenance of a universal uh, system of supporting living standards. It became the control of inflation and the freedom of, uh, uh, of enterprises um, and the reduction of taxes and public spending. So the goals of economic policy were fundamentally changed um, when the neoliberal paradigm came in. Secondly, 
the, neo the neoliberal paradigm rested on a body of neoclassical uh, economic theory, which uh, argued that markets, the freer the market, the more efficient they were, and the more that would maximize uh, welfare. Uh, market failure was permitted and, and was uh, understood in the neoclassical paradigm, and so there were justified government interventions because of market failure, but there was also state failure. Governments were captured by special interests, by their own interests, uh, and so there was um, uh, suspicion, uh, skepticism about government action, and so on, limited multipliers and so on. Um, the narratives, the public language of the neoliberal paradigm is familiar to us. Um, as Anatole has very cleverly pointed out, what a lot of positive words are attached to the discourse of neoliberalism. Free markets, free enterprise, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And lastly, there's a set of policies which characterize um, uh, the, uh, that, uh, uh, that paradigm, the deregulation, particularly of capital, financial, and labor markets, privatization, low taxation, public spending, and so on, a, f a policy package with which we're all familiar. It's important to say that as well as a shift in a whole paradigm, there are also modifications of paradigms. Um, and we argue that we need to understand not just a kind of dichotomy of an old and a new paradigm, but the process of modification of, uh, and two. So there were very important modifications of the neoliberal paradigm in the period of, of uh, Neue Mitte, third way governments, particularly in the 1990s. Schroeder here, Blair in the UK, Clinton uh, in the US, Jospin uh, in France. Um, so there was some re-regulation of financial markets and banking, a lot of emphasis on the supply side, particularly in education and training to get people into the labor market, in work tax credits, um, public infrastructure, and so on. So the neoliberal model has not remained unchanged since its heyday in the 1980s, it has been modified. But the core, the core bases of the neoliberal model, we argue, have not been changed. That, that emphasis on, uh, uh, um, uh, on the goals, on the methods, uh, and, and so on, on the discourse uh, was not changed. So here's how you can see um, uh, 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 the modification and the new process occurring. So let's look at trade policy. In the core neoliberal, neoclassical model, Trade, deregulation of trade, freer trade, liberalization of trade is good. It raises GDP. In the modified model, you acknowledge that it is good, but it also has adverse uh, distributional effects in particular. So you need some ancillary policies to go along with your free trade, liberalization of trade policy in order to ameliorate those effects. A new paradigm might argue that those are so critical that actually you question whether liberalization of trade is the right goal at all. So it's not simply a question of adding on additional policies to ameliorate its effects, um, but there are more important goals and simply raising GDP and some of the uh, disbenefits in inequalities, environmental unsustainability and so on, uh, call for a different kind of trade agreement. Not a liberalizing trade agreement, but one whose primary goal is raising and maintaining standards. Another example would be climate change. The neoclassical, traditionally, the orthodox, the old paradigm would say climate change uh, is not a major economic priority. Um, the modified paradigm would say, yes, it is. So we need pricing policies, particularly carbon taxes, uh, to try and uh, do this. We will incorporate those into our growth model. In a new paradigm, you might argue that decarbonization is actually so important that it takes priority over growth and that you need to build in decarbonization into the core structures of the way production and consumption occur. So you need a much more radical set of uh, policies to do that. So we have this model of paradigm shifting in the past. And the question is, are we now at another moment of paradigm shift? The conditions that I argue tend to occur when paradigm changes occur, that process of an of a, of a original paradigm failing under conditions of crisis, the policy prescriptions no longer working, and then a new model coming in because it seems to offer better solutions, is one that we can certainly identify over the last 10 years. The financial crash was a major problem for the old paradigm. It was, in a sense, uh, the clearest uh, uh, indication that we'd had that the old paradigm no longer uh, was no longer able to provide what it, wanted, uh, what it claimed to be able to do so. The period of austerity since, in which inequality has been rising, uh, living standards have been stagnating, uh, indicates that the solutions which the old paradigm wanted to propose have not worked. So the question is, are we at the moment for a new paradigm? So that, in a sense, is the very process that, we that you can identify in the 1930s and 40s and the 1970s and 80s, you could argue, has occurred in the last decade. Here are a set, I'm not going to go through all of these, here are a set of kind of the key points of the failures of the policy of the neoliberal policy paradigm. Even in its modified form that we can see, 
um, that we can identify over the last 10 years. A, uh, these are, we are familiar with these, the, the, uh, the typical failures of, uh, of Western capitalism uh, over the last 10 years, and there's more of them. So the question then, which in a sense we are here to discuss, is are we at the moment of a new paradigm, of a paradigm shift? And secondly, if so, what is it? What would be uh, in it? And the argument that, um, uh, uh, that uh, I would want to make is that although there is nothing quite of the simplicity and, in a sense, the coherence of the Keynesian alternative to laissez-faire in the 1930s and 40s and the free market alternative to Keynesianism in the 1970s and 80s, both of which were associated with single authors or a very small number of authors. So Keynes really was the architect of Keynesianism, even though there were other people like Kletsky and others who were working in the same field. And Hayek and Friedman really are the authors of the neoliberal political economic paradigm, even though there were other neoclassical economists as well. And Lucas and other people came along afterwards and were very important. There isn't yet a coherent, a, an obviously coherent body of thought, particularly wrapped up in single authors, which we could yet say constitutes the new paradigm. But I don't think that means that there isn't therefore a new paradigm uh, developing. So I do think that in this right-hand column here, there are uh, new ways of analyzing the uh, economy, um, new kinds of policies which have emerged over the last 10 years, which do constitute a new way um, uh, of thinking, where new goals are paramount um, and where new discourses um, uh, 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 are now being heard. So that was the free market uh, paradigm. This is what I think uh, a new paradigm might look like. Firstly, new goals. Um, we're no longer in a world where GDP growth is sufficient. GDP growth now is clearly associated with a set of economic ills. Um, and in work that we've been doing for the OECD, for the New Approaches to Economic Challenges initiative, which William runs, we've identified four goals which really now should take priority over GDP growth alone. They are environmental sustainability, um, the reduction uh, in inequalities, uh, improvements in individual and social well-being, and what we call system resilience, the ability of an economic system to withstand shocks without going into collapse in the way that uh, we've seen in finance and we may well be witnessing uh, in the environment. Secondly, a set of analytical frameworks drawn from what we in the economics world would know as heterodox economics. So one of the really interesting things that's been happening over the last 10 years is a flowering of non-neoclassical forms of economics tending to be in specific silos of what are known as heterodox schools, evolutionary, behavioral, institutional, feminist, ecological, um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and others, and complexity being the principal ones. But within those schools, very, very uh, analytically powerful forms of uh, study emerging, which are contributing to our understanding of major uh, parts of uh, economic life and which, although they are often presented as separate, can be put together. And one of the things I think is interesting here in the work of, the, uh, of INET, which Anatole will talk about, is the way in which we can synthesize what at the moment are rather separate, isolated schools within, uh, uh, within the academy. And new discourse is beginning to emerge, usually not from the economists, but from civil society, about the kind of uh, society uh, that a new paradigm uh, would lead to. And these seem to me to be the seven core elements of a policy framework that it were, would emerge out of such a paradigm. I'll run through them very, very quickly, but we can talk uh, more about these. The first one and the prior one is securing sustainability. If we do not limit the environmental impacts of our economies, we are heading for catastrophe. And that is now evident to all of us, and yet we do not yet have the policies in place which are doing that. And 40 years of European environmental policy has left almost all environmental indicators in Europe going backwards. The only ones that are not going backwards are greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason they're not going backwards is because we have placed uh, tight limits on them and we have started moving our economies to live within those limits. We've not done that on the rest of the environment and that's why we have crises of biodiversity loss, species depletion, soil erosion, pollution of the oceans uh, and so on. 
Secondly, we need to raise investment. Our economies have become too consumption driven, less in Germany than uh, in other places, certainly in the US and the UK. We need to raise investment that is critical to the green uh, uh, agenda, and that will require much more active macro policy, particularly fiscal policy, and much more active industrial policy. Thirdly, we need to redirect finance. Too much of the financial sector is still going into speculative activities, into trading rather than into investment, into real estate and land, uh, and into assets uh, which are volatile and which cause asset uh, bubbles uh, and, and busts. There are a bunch of reforms in corporate governance, in the regulation of, in the macro prudential regulation of, uh, of the financial sector, in national investment banks for those countries like the UK which don't have them, financial transaction taxes and so on. Fourthly, curbing corporate power. One of the really striking features of our modern economy today is that we have monopolies in almost all major sectors. And in certain sectors, notably the digital platforms, ones which are exercising a degree of monopoly power, which is really unprecedented in, in modern capitalism, at least since the heyday of the, of the great oil and uh, railroad companies and so on. And as the European Union is already uh, showing, as presidential candidates in the US are talking about, we have an agenda now of what to do about corporate power and whether they could be, uh, some of these companies could be broken up or regulated or whatever. Fifth, rebalancing labor markets. In all of our economies, we have now a long-term process of the declining share of labor in national income, um, the rising share of profits. We need to rebalance our labor markets so that workers get a rising share. We need to widen the ownership of capital, um, and we need to provide public goods. Uh, so these, it seems to me, drawing on a whole literature coming out of many, many think tanks and others uh, over recent years, provides us with a sevenfold, if you like, uh, agenda of policy change that, if done, would constitute uh, a new paradigm. Uh, this is some work that I've been involved in, in doing over the last few years, setting this out, um, and I'll be glad to take comments and questions later. Thank you.